Good evening. Uh, we're going to take a few minutes to allow people to join the meeting and we'll get started in just a few. Thank you. And now we'll have the interpreter interpret that in Spanish. Buenas tardes. Vamos a esperar unos minutos más para que se vayan uniendo. Gracias. Good evening, I just wanted to say one more time, we're gonna let uh, a few more people join us that have um, are now coming into the room and is uh, maybe in like two minutes, we will get started. Thank you very much. Y buenas tardes una vez más. Eh, vamos a esperar un poco más a que la gente se una a la sala y vamos a esperar unos dos minutos más. Gracias. Okay, um, we're going to get started. As a preliminary matter, we do have Spanish interpretation available. If you look at the bottom of your screen where you see the chat button, uh, there's also uh, going to be an interpreter button, a globe with a grid, and you just need to press that and select English or Spanish. And we'll have our interpreter say that and then we'll get started. Buenas tardes a todos. Entonces vamos a comenzar con la reunión. Solamente como anuncio, contamos con interpretación en español que la pueden encontrar en la parte de abajo de la barra del Zoom junto al chat. Y es un icono de globo que tienen que presionar para seleccionar inglés o español. Gracias. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome. Uh, my name is Mary Catherine Gibbs. I am the land use attorney for HRP, um, Hilco Redevelopment Partners. They are the owner of the Potomac River Generating Station site. And I want to welcome you to what is the 10th community engagement event that HRP has organized to discuss the redevelopment of the Potomac River Generating Station here in Old Town North. Before we begin, there's just a few items that I'd like to review at the beginning of every meeting. I know we've been doing Zoom for a couple of years, but just want to make sure. Audience members, uh, please note you're muted on both audio and camera. Uh, we do this to ensure that we're able to efficiently review the material and ask uh, answer all of your questions. If you're interested in asking questions or making comments, we ask that you either submit those through the Q&A function you should be seeing at the bottom of your screen or raise your hand in the question and answer period that will take place after we finished our presentation. We do ask that people who are asking questions verbally do so in a respectful time frame and manner so that as many people as possible get the opportunity to have their questions and comments addressed. If you would like to submit your questions in writing, you can click on the Q&A icon where you will then be prompted to type and submit your questions. We will try to log all questions on our end. The chat box function will not work. We'll be gathering questions received during the meeting and we'll answer as many of them as we can during the question and answer session. Any questions we're unable to cover in the time frame we've allotted for tonight's meeting will be saved so we can provide written answers to all and post them on our website in a couple of weeks as we've done for all other meetings. 
We're also recording this meeting and we'll post a recording of this meeting on our website as well. For those of you who are joining us by phone, you can also send questions and comments to HRP Info Mid Atlantic at hilcoglobal.com. We'll do our best to check this email and to ask and answer these questions during the meeting. If we're not able to answer your questions during the meeting due to time limitations, we will share the answer along with all the questions asked to our website at www.hrpalx.com, where the answers to all of the questions asked during community meetings are posted. We're here to listen to your comments and answer your questions to the greatest extent we can. We'll be covering a lot of information tonight and we will leave plenty of time for questions and we can always go back to a slide during question and answers if you'd like. Again, thank you all for being here tonight and let's get started. We're gonna be covering a lot of topics tonight. Um, we've had a number of meetings and this is an opportunity for us to um, let you know what we've heard and how we've been moving forward with our plans. We're gonna cover the history and the vision for the site. We're gonna talk about the community engagement and outreach that we've already had. We're gonna talk about the land uses, open space, transportation, environmental, environmental and sustainability, and then talk about next steps. Now I'm gonna turn it over to Melissa Schrock. Thank you, Mary Catherine. Uh, well, good evening, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I'm Melissa Schrock, and I lead the mixed use development team at Hilco Redevelopment Partners. We're very happy to see all of you here uh, tonight as we review the coordinated development district plan and all the various topics that we've discussed together at our previous meetings over the last 15 months. Uh, as we approach the CDD approval milestone, we thought it was appropriate to reflect on the community's efforts that created the opportunity for us to even consider the transformation of the PRGS site. This former coal-fired power plant uh, emitted approximately 200 million metric tons of CO2 during its operation. Next slide. And it was finally closed in 2012, thanks to the advocacy of Alexandrians and their city leaders. And then a vision for its transformation was formulated during a two plus year community planning process that was codified in the Old Town North Small Area Plan adopted by city council in 2017. Next slide. Thanks to the community's activism and to the city's forward thinking and comprehensive community planning efforts, HRP was able to acquire the site in late 2020 and to begin the process of its transformation into a vibrant new destination within the Old Town, uh, within Old Town Alexandria community that is guided by the framework laid out in the small area plan. Next slide. This shared vision encompasses a welcoming, walkable and sustainable waterfront district containing a mix of both housing, including affordable housing and commercial uses such as retail, restaurants, arts, cultural and innovation space surrounded on both sides by significant new or improved public open space offering a variety of recreational opportunities for the whole neighborhood to enjoy. Next slide, please. Through all the conversations that we've had with our neighbors, city staff and city leaders over the last 15 months, we've developed three primary design drivers that synthesize what we've heard and inform the physical planning of the CDD area. I'll now turn it over to my colleague, Michelle Chang, who will touch on each of these three principles briefly. Michelle. Thanks, Melissa. So this property has been completely cut off from Old Town North neighborhood. It's in fact cut off the Old Town North community itself between Slaters and Bashford Lane and has dramatically limited access to National Park Service amenities and the waterfront for the neighborhood. And so the first uh, guiding principle is just to reintegrate the site. We wanna tear down the barrier, remove the power plant, the fence, the walls, and just reconnect, open up the space to the Old Town North neighborhood. And it's really critical to our vision of a friendly, inviting, walkable, mixed use neighborhood like Melissa just described to really create that environment and re-knit the site back into the neighborhood and urban fabric that already has the residents, the small businesses, and, and like I said, just like reconnect. And this has been part of, um, and is consistent with the small area plan. 
We've continued to work um, to integrate the existing street network. And we do that from the south with uh, continuation of North Fairfax Street and Royal Street. And then the third is Slater's Lane up to the north, just re reconnecting again the site. There are two other potential connections that are dependent on those landholders. One of them is at Pitt Street. And then the other one is a potential connection that you'll hear more about later on tonight that connects the Spine Road to Abingdon and potentially to the Parkway. And so we'll move to our second, thanks, to our second principle, which is again, to just connect people to the waterfront. We have heard from the community over and over and just like a resounding response that they want more access and more usable connection to the waterfront. And so here we focused on, you know, optimization of views. So real considerations, and you can see how we turned the roadways going in to the site towards the roadways. And so you get really a really great visual opening. And then later on, we'll describe more about the physical connection and that connectivity to the Potomac River. But really by orienting the roadway network in this way, it really shortens that physical distance. Which really leads me to the third of our uh, guiding principles, which is to provide meaningful open space. And so again, you know, I talked earlier about those view corridors and here this open space and unlocking the open space, we really create a series of different parks that are all connected on the site. And so on our property itself, we're delivering approximately 5.8 acres of park space. There is waterfront space, and that is three acres of our property, and then shared with the National Park Service, opens up over eight acres of waterfront park access. Simon will tell you more about all of this later on today. And then the linear park, there is almost two acres along the linear park on PRGS property. When shared with uh, future uh, with Norfolk Southern land, which is about three acres, you get an almost five acre site. And this is in um, coordination with the city and other landholders to potentially bring a really great, you know, potential rails to trails like park to help again, reconnect the site to the existing neighborhood. We also have a central plaza, which is right in front of Block D. And you'll hear more about the Wunarf, which we've had resounding positive feedback. And this is really at the central plaza, a focus for activity. And so you get a great sense of activity, but you also get, again, access to the waterfront and great park space. Towards the back, we have a park area that we call Pepco Liner. That's just behind Block's E and F. And that is a very long linear area. And while it might look small here, it is almost too, it's, it's very extensive. I think it's almost like 600 um, feet long and you get like a great amount of programming space um, that's, that's shared and connected to other areas. So while we continue to share the vision, we'll go to the next slide and really think about, you know, the vibrant, friendly community that we're opening up here. Because again, the result of this vision is a reconnected Old Town North, reconnected to the waterfront and connected to over 14 acres of park space. HRP, and you'll hear later on tonight, just more about a thoughtful, holistic approach that we have to redevelopment. And each of these vignettes here really show and evoke different aspects of our vision. Retail activation, rhythm to the ground floor entries, the connection of activity between the land and the waterfront, and the um, focus on you know, really opening up the waterfront both visually and opportunities to interact with it physically. The goal here again is really a culmination of a vibrant and friendly continuation of the Old Town North neighborhood. So while we are very early in the development process that will continue over many years, you know, we really want to take this vision that we've shared with you tonight and lay the groundwork for future development. So later on, Mary Catherine will describe the series of approvals in the process, and one of them will be design considerations for later phased buildings. As part of the CDD process now, 
we're thinking about how these design considerations for future buildings, future development special use permits will be reviewed within the context of the urban design standards and guidelines for the PRGS site. Design elements that, um, all our design elements will be exemplary and, um, and, and you know, will be of high quality and character but for those who are of a very exemplary building and massing and detailing and energy efficiency and con conservation, we may pursue those in an alternative design excellence path. But again, all buildings and open space design will incorporate context sensitive scale and character and quality materials. And with that, I'll pass it off to Mary Catherine. Thanks, Michelle. Um, we wanted to talk through with you so that you understand how much uh, community engagement we've uh, participated in and how important that is uh, to this process. Can we go to the next slide? Engaging with the community is very important to, to Hilco Redevelopment Partners. And in that vein, we have had multiple events uh, to engage with the community even before we submitted our first uh, CDD concept plan to the city at the end of last July. If you've seen any of these meetings before, you have seen this chart and you have seen this timeline and we have progressed from February of 2021, our very first one of these meetings until now. What we, decide, what we did on a number of occasions was have topical discussions where we did deep dives into very important topics related to the redevelopment, including the environment, environmental remediation, sustainability, open space, land uses, and transportation. And tonight, we're gonna to talk through all of those topics. All of these submissions and topical meetings are moving us towards public hearings on what's called the CDD concept plan at, on June 23rd with the Planning Commission and on July 5th with the City Council. Next slide. We continue to think it's extremely important to demonstrate how much additional outreach besides just our community meetings that we've engaged with in, in part of this process. As we said previously, we started over a year ago on February 11th with our first community meeting. But this is a very big project and it deserves significant discussion and input from many stakeholders, including you. So far, we have held over 25 meetings with the community, the city staff, National Park Service, and others. And we'll be having uh, a, a couple of additional meetings. We're gonna do site tours, as you can see highlighted there on June 11th, and excuse me, June 10th and 11th. Information on registration for those tours will be forthcoming and will be on our website. Significant input was solicited and helped move us through this process. We're working hard to make sure that, that your input was uh, included in all of the plans that we've uh, submitted to the city of Alexandria and um, <laughs> excuse me, and as I said, we're moving towards those public hearings on June 23rd and July 5th. So where are we in this process? Next slide. It's important to understand the development review process in Alexandria. And you can see that blue arrow is pointing you to the far left column. That's where we are right now. That's called the Coordinated Development District. That is essentially the zoning for the project. It is establishing where the blocks are, the general road layout, where our parks are, where are how much square footage we can get per block, what heights would go on each block. Um, it is very much a general guide for the project itself. It is not including specific roadway layouts specific buildings or anything of that nature. As we move from the first column to the DSP in the second column, a development site plan, that will start to drill down on the details of the roadway network and the streetscape and the utilities for the site. And then the next column is when we actually get to developing the buildings. It's called a development special use permit. Each one of the blocks as part of this project is going to come forward with a specific um, plan for the architecture, the specific uses for the, each block. And that's the point at which those design guidelines and design standards that uh, Michelle was just talking about are going to be applied. Next slide. Melissa. Thanks, Mary Catherine. Um, so obviously with all of the engagement, we've heard a lot of comments and feedback. And if you've attended um, any of our 
meetings um, or looked on our website, you've seen that we have uh, written all of the comments that we've gotten and questions that we've gotten down and responded to all of them in writing, but we thought it was useful to just highlight some of them here. Obviously, there's a lot of excitement over the opportunity for the new open space that project uh, will deliver and a desire to get better access to the waterfront. There's also been a lot of support for re reducing the carbon footprint of the project, the mix of uses uh, that the project will deliver. Affordable housing has been a topic, cycling and new transportation and transit infrastructure and traffic mitigation, um, connecting to uh, small businesses in the community has been a topic of conversation as well, uh, as well as I think a lot of people around town uh, now are very familiar with the concept of the Woonerf as a shared and living street that prioritizes uh, pedestrian circulation and the way that we have uh, divided, sort of separated vehicular from pedestrian uh, circulation within the site um, has been, um, uh, I, I would say, embraced by the community at, at large. Next slide. So even though the CDD stage is still very, very early in the overall process of redeveloping a site like PRGS with all the complexity that it involves, we're already considering the ways in which the project will share value with the community across a variety of aspects in the form of community benefits. And we thought it would be helpful to provide some early information on the categories and the costs and valuations that are associated with those benefits. First and foremost, um, as everybody knows, this was a coal-fired power plant uh, for over 60 years, and then it was left uh, a basically abandoned for about a decade, uh, and, now, um, and now we've acquired it, and there will be significant uh, site remediation that will need to be performed in addition to abatement and demolition of the existing structure. We have early uh, estimates of that of approximately $60 million. Uh, there'll be a significant economic benefit that's delivered with the project, both in terms of jobs that will be created during the construction period. We estimate that'll be approximately 1,100 construction jobs, as well as uh, close to 2,000 permanent jobs once the project is fully built out. And then there will be new tax revenue, of course, for uh, the city of Alexandria associated with the new space that will be delivered, both commercial and residential space. And we estimate that over an approximately 11 year um, construction plus early occupancy period that that would total about $35 million in net uh, taxes to the city of Alexandria. And if you look at the cumulative um, direct and indirect economic benefits from the project across the region that you can trace out a $2.8 billion cumulative uh, impact. Uh, on the affordable housing front, as we mentioned, that's definitely been something people have been interested in uh, seeing on the project. And we've been working very hard with the Office of Housing to come up with a three-pronged approach to address this issue in the city of Alexandria. First, there will be the voluntary uh, monetary contribution that's paid on a per square foot basis in terms of uh, what uses get built out on the site. And then we will develop on-site affordable housing units through the use of bonus density. And additionally, we are um, looking at how, to, how we can work together with the city to form a public-private partnership to develop a dedicated uh, on-site affordable uh, project on the, on the site. Overall, we think that's uh, cost going to cost approximately 50 to 110 or $111 million. Next slide, please. Um, open space and activation. This is uh, something that was a big topic of discussion in the small area plan and something that this project has a great opportunity uh, to fulfill the vision that was um, set forth by the community. Uh, we talked a little bit about it, uh, Michelle talked a little bit about it, and Simon uh, from OJB, our landscape architect, will, will speak about it in more detail. But a cumulative of across our site and the abutting properties, there will be 14.2 acres of publicly accessible open space that will either be newly created or improved through the project. And we've been working hand in hand with the city of Alexandria and the National Park Service 
to work out the details of what that's going to look like. It's gonna have a mix of both active and passive recreational spaces and include the potential use of the former pump house that you can see from the Mount Vernon Trail. Uh, the estimated costs of the delivering all of those landscape improvements are between 30 and $35 million. On the environmental sustainability front, and we'll touch on that as well uh, tonight with Mike Babcock, our uh, consultant from Sustainable Building Partners, we've been um, we've worked with the city to develop a um, carbon neutrality analysis that we did voluntarily during the CDD period, and that set certain targets, or we set certain targets in terms of uh, how we can reduce our carbon footprint. We're going to talk about those targets a little bit later, but we think we've been very aggressive and have actually exceeded what the city policies and requirements are. Uh, we have early cost estimates of what it will take to implement those, um, uh, those uh, systems on the site of approximately $65 million. And then on the transportation and connectivity front, uh, as Michelle uh, already touched on, and you'll hear um, from Dan at Grove Slade, our uh, tra traffic and transportation engineer, uh, more details, but we're bringing new streets into the site and we'll also be improving um, the uh, traffic circulation around us. And so uh, across both the on and off site transportation and traffic improvements, our early estimates are approximately $27 million. So this isn't intended to be a definitive list or, and these certainly aren't all the final costs, but we do believe in having a transparent dialogue with the community as we move through the process. And so we thought it was important to share these early details and estimates with you. Next slide. And with that, I think I'm gonna turn it back over to Mary Catherine. Actually, I think I'm jumping in here. Going to Carolyn. Carolyn, my bad. <laughs> That's okay. Um, I'm Carolyn Sponza. I'm a principal with Gensler's DC office and good evening everyone. Um, I'm going to talk briefly about the land use strategy um, for the site and future redevelopment. So any discussion about land use strategy needs to start with an idea about site context and constraints. And the PRGS site is approximately 18.8 acres and you can see it here in the sort of magenta line that's dashed and goes around the property. Um, the property has a number of um, abutters and neighbors, including National Park Service to the east, the Pepco substation, which is um, going to remain to the west, and the Norfolk Southern Corporation uh, land that was mentioned earlier to the southwest. So in, in addition to those neighbors, there's a number of things on the site that are really interesting and have um, influenced the land use strategy, namely easements, including transmission line easements and fiber line easements and setbacks that are required um, uh, nearest to the National Park Service property. So when you consider those easements, which are areas where um, uh, building development is limited, you only really have about 11.9 uh, acres where you can have building development on the site. And if you think a little bit further, in addition, you need to have sidewalks, roads, and open space. So once you add those components, the um, uh, approximate developable area of the property is between seven and eight acres. I touched briefly in the last slide on the um, concept of easements and the easements that are shown here in orange were unknown at the time that the Old Town North small area plan uh, was developed. So that provides uh, some challenges, right? There's not as much horizontal land on which to build, but it also provides um, some advantages. Because of the way the easements are located, particularly on the southwest edge of the property, the setback that was initially shown of only 100 feet between the edge of the property and development and adjacent properties has been expanded to 200 feet. So there is an additional buffer zone because of that easement between future building construction and existing um, buildings uh, surrounding the site today. Just for a little bit of context before we talk about land use numbers, the area that was in the season that could basically not be developed would be equivalent to 350,000 square feet of space. And now actually thinking a little bit further about the mix of uses, um, flexibility at this phase is key. 
And what the development plan proposes is a six block development starting with block A and going up to block F on the northern side of the site in addition to two potentially redeveloped um, and reused structures that are existing today, the pump house and the guard house. So between those six blocks and the potentially um, reused structures, um, this project is anticipated up to 2.5 million um, square feet of development that could be distributed flexib flexibly between commercial and residential uses. Commercial uses include office, innovation, hotel, retail, and the arts, and those could be between 20 and 60% of the overall development, and then residential would be the remainder of that estimated between 40 and 80%. Um, the colors that you see on each of these blocks indicate the potential mix of uses that would be allowed on any of those blocks. And what you see is there's a lot of colors on a lot of the blocks, which means that maximum flexibility and uses has been planned at this time so that in the future, development of each of the blocks could pivot to respond to market conditions, making the project more responsive to what's happening in the um, neighborhood and the overall market in general. And then taking this a step farther and thinking about proposed heights, we looked at three major um, considerations when uh, determining what some of the likely heights for these blocks would be. So the first would be context, the second one would be the Old Town North Small Area Plan guidance, and the third would be um, limitations um, because of the site's proximity to uh, Reagan National Airport. There are certain FAA uh, maximums that uh, have been established across the site um, to respond to basically aircraft movement um, uh, in the area. So um, what you see in the diagram on the right is an illustration of the proposed heights by block. So there is a variety of heights starting with up to 70 feet on the south side, up to 172 feet in the middle, and up to 160 on the northern parcels. Everything in green represents areas that will basically be um, open space or developed for only structures up to 30 feet. So this is um, what was proposed as part of the Old Town North Small Area Plan using many of the same um, color conventions. And what you see is that there's a lot more of the property that will basically only be developed up to 30 feet and that the height has really been concentrated onto these um, development parcels. Um, I did wanna stress that even though there are up to heights located on each of these blocks, that does not indicate that each of the blocks is going to be a box that is up to that height. That is only intended to illustrate the maximum height on each of the parcels. And it is anticipated that each block will have a variety of heights up to that height. So just to give you a little bit of scale context, on block C, for instance, you could get a number of smaller structures, residential um, or commercial, that basically would vary in height up to the maximum heights established. For context in the corner, we've listed um, sort of a comparative number of floors because sometimes it's difficult to visualize heights. Um, so you could sort of um, get an idea comparing to other buildings that you're familiar with what the heights would be equivalent to. And although heights are important, a lot of the excitement and realization of a space really comes um, down to what happens at the ground plane. So as people walk across the ground plane of a project, they only really understand and appreciate the first 30 feet of um, building right above the ground plane. So that's why this plan has taken attention to creating uh, primary and secondary retail corridors in order to establish concentrated continuous retail um, that's street focused, transparent, vibrant, and has a mix of waterfront and Old Town North facing retail. So it's important that all aspects of this project are responsive to creating an active ground level pedestrian friendly realm um, augmented by the location of retail. This diagram indicates some possible primary retail um, concentrations in red, which are around that open space that um, Simon will talk about shortly. 
and possible second retail concentrations on elevations shown in orange. In addition to retail frontages, we know that we'll have frequent building entries for a variety of uses um, that will also help an animate and draw foot traffic across all aspects of the site. And just a quick note about phasing. Um, the development plan that I shared shows the full build vision for the site, but because of the um, nature of development and the amount of development, we know that um, development of the site will need to be phased over time. And that phasing just doesn't anticipate building phasing. It also needs to consider abatement and deconstruction of the existing structures on the site, of which the um, power plant is the largest, but not the only structure, site remediation where required, development of in infrastructure, such as those important roadways and sidewalks, open space development, and then the individual block and building construction. So around development of each block, there's been careful consideration that will be a future reviewed in future um, submissions that ties together block development with infrastructure development and open space development. Um, most importantly, it's important to understand that uh, development at this point in time is anticipated to occur from south, so in the area that we show is phase one, up through phase two and three to the north. This strategy will also tie into um, the coordination of the below grade parking, which has been talked about um, extensively in other presentations, as some of these buildings have the opportunity to share parking uses. And with that, Mary Catherine. Thanks, Carolyn. Um, we wanted to talk through with you an important use on the site, um, affordable housing and arts. We have been working with the city's Office of Housing to develop a plan for moving forward in providing multiple alternatives for affordable housing opportunities on the site. The first is a voluntary contribution. This is an early estimate of what the voluntary contribution amount would be, uh, but that amount is, is determined at the time of a specific building coming forward, and it depends on the specific uses as proposed because there are different amounts that are um, uh, contributed uh, if you have a commercial use versus a residential use. The second of these is bonus density under the city's current regulations for affordable housing and arts bonus. We are asking, uh, based on that 350,000 square feet that could not be built in the um, easement area that Carolyn just described, we are looking to add um, that 350,000 with potential bonus density or, a, a, <clears throat> excuse me, affiliated and split 50-50 between half for affordable housing, half for the arts to be delivered in phases as the project achieves that bonus density. However, um, that, Third prong that I wanted to talk to you about has the potential to utilize a portion of that arts density bonus for affordable housing. What we're talking about, well, first let me mention my apologies. When you do an affordable housing bonus, if you get a certain amount of square footage, the city's ordinance requires that you provide a third of that additional density in on-site affordable units. And that is what we um, have worked with the city uh, to um, provide as part of this process for the first 175,000 square feet of affordable housing bonus density. The third prong is an opportunity, as Melissa um, uh, mentioned earlier, an opportunity to enter into with the city and a potential affordable housing development partner, um, a PPP, a public-private partnership, to create a dedicated affordable housing project on the site that would utilize a large portion of the other half of the density bonus that we, uh, for the arts and use it for affordable housing. The remaining bonus density would then be utilized for an arts bonus density and the city's ordinance requires if you utilize the arts bonus density that you provide an arts anchor on your site um, in, in the context of providing that space rent free for a period of years. What this all does is creates a really great opportunity to expand the potential for affordable housing and arts uses on this site. Next slide. 
One of the other things that we're looking to implement here, which was contemplated under the small area plan, is extending the arts and cultural district from the end of Fairfax Street into the site. As we are extending Fairfax Street, we're going to be uh, extending the arts district into the power plant site. The Old Town North small area plan specifically envisioned that the arts district would culminate uh, in this site. So what we are working with the city to do is to achieve that goal of the small area plan by bringing arts uses into this site. And since the vibrancy of Fairfax Street and all of the other arts uses that have extended down this way, it really makes a lot of sense to bring that art into our site. Next slide. I'm gonna turn it over to Simon Beer from OJB. Thanks, Mary Catherine. Uh, my name is Simon Beer. I'm a landscape architect and principal with OJB Landscape Architecture in Boston. I'm very glad to be here this evening to share an overview regarding the potential of this site and the expansion of open space for the community. So I wanted to begin by sharing some of the results from an open space poll that we ran during a public meeting. And it was also publicly open during the months of November and December last year. We had over 200 participants respond. There were five questions that pertain to different programs and activities ranging from passive and active in their typology. Through this, several topics came to the forefront of our focus for programming moving forward. These topics centered around engaging the waterfront of the Potomac River and enhancements of pedestrian circulation through the site and amongst the open spaces. We really appreciated the community's participation that has helped us to lay a framework for design moving forward. On the next slide, as we look at this overall conceptual open space plan, as Michelle had described earlier, the site is surrounded by current or potential open space in addition to what's already being proposed on the, gener the generating station site. It was considered in the small area plan and our team is thinking about these spaces as contiguous park area without the property lines acting as divisible limits to, to the design potential. Now, with that being said, the National Park Service land will still very much be maintained as National Parks Service land and with the same vernacular and aesthetic associated with that type of open space. Our intent would be to seamlessly blend that which is the new open space with what is currently existing. So this slide is really meant to showcase how we've begun to think about the qualities, the activities, and the proportions of these open space and as, as combined, uh, how they may begin to create this differentiated sequence and experience for the user. But let's dive into each space individually. At waterfront zone A to the north of our site, this is a unique peninsula of wooded landscape that touches down to the water. While the majority of the space is National Park Service land, in conjunction with the open space on the PRGS property, we envision light touches to the natural landscape that's there today, preserving trees and mitigating invasive species while providing more accessibility to reach this unique spot. Perhaps bird watching and educational opportunities of the natural environment and shoreline with areas to stop along the Mount Vernon Trail. And then as we continue to move south, into waterfront zone B, the programmed elements become a little bit more active. Waterfront zone B is connected to the central plaza within the development. And through the middle of this connection, there's a unique shared street concept called a Wooner, as mentioned before. And this prioritizes pedestrian movement between the plaza and the waterfront, uh, maximizing the potential for people to, uh, to take advantage of that access. The plaza may have elements like water features and kiosks, while the waterfront itself has the opportunity for an event lawn and better access down to the water. Also wanted to mention that our team is studying the potential for the adaptive reuse of the pump house that's there today as an amenity along the waterfront with the potential of a dock that could accommodate a water taxi. And as we move further south into waterfront zone C, the landscape program, again, maybe begin to become a little bit more passive and natural with the aesthetics of the water's edge and the National Park Service land. Additional trails, passive lawns, and better connections to the waterfront with overlooks uh, out to the Potomac River uh, may be provided. To the very south of the site with the potential arts use that Mary Catherine had mentioned, 
there's great connections between the open space and that cultural resource. On the next slide, we'll talk about a little added bonus of open space in the adjacent PEPCO substation. This area acts as screening to the substation infrastructure and has the potential to have linear program elements like bocce courts, a dog run, comfortable landscape seating areas. And this stretch of space also allows for the complete circumventing of open space around the entirety of the development, improving on those pedestrian connections through and around the site. And last but certainly not least, the exciting linear park uh, to the southwest of the site has a unique gradient of programming ranging from passive to active. As described in the SAP, there's a potential for these different types of programs like kids play, games courts, sustainable landscape features, fitness elements, and much more. In conjunction with the potential Norfolk Southern land, the linear park connects to the waterfront towards George Washington Memorial Parkway, it creates great connectivity. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dan with Grove Slade to discuss transportation in a little bit more detail. All right, thank you very much, Simon. Uh, good evening, I'm Dan Van Pelt. I'm a vice president and senior principal with Grove Slade. Grove Slade's a local transportation planning and engineering firm with offices in the city of Alexandria. Uh, we've been working with the team on the transportation study and elements of the redevelopment of the site, and I'm gonna walk through those with you tonight. In terms of an overview of the functionality and layout of the streets within the project, one of the primary design drivers was to separate the flows of vehicles and more vulnerable road users like pedestrians and cyclists for safety and comfort, and for people of all ages and abilities. To the west of the blocks, there's a multimodal spine street that will provide primary access and circulation for vehicles and buses, that's in blue. To the east of the blocks, there's a people-focused street along the water facilities uh, the, uh, the, I'm sorry, that facilitates pedestrian and bicycle movements, including the Wunerf, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment, and that's what's shown in red. There's also uh, an intentional design choice regarding how the streets lay out uh, that discourages cut through while providing porosity and connectivity that are currently lacking in this area. This, uh, this slide sh uh, shows in a little bit more detail the many points of connection and circulation that were available throughout the site and connecting to existing facilities and the wider transportation network. A thoughtful approach has been taken to balance the needs of the different travel modes across the site uh, with deliberate strategy of design around accommodating people of all ages and abilities. Next slide, please. The multimodal transportation study included a thorough review of pedestrian facilities in and around the site. Pedestrian access and circulation uh, for people of, again, of all ages and abilities has been a primary focus of the design. Uh, and the project has been designed with pedestrian friendly strategies that include things like controlled crosswalks, curve extensions, uh, timing and phasing strategies at, at the signals uh, to balance a prioritization of modes, uh, promotion of safety and vision uh, a vision zero strategies, a wooner, multiple uh, multi-use paths, ample sidewalks, activation of building frontages, and green and programmable open spaces. Uh, the graphic uh, on the right shows the expected pedestrian routes through and around the site. And for, uh, for those that are familiar with the site today, you can get a sense of how much more pleasant, porous, and connected this part of the city will be as compared to today. I wanted to emphasize that working with our colleagues at the city and the park service, the National Park Service, and based on feedback and coordination we've had with the community, all of the recommendation mitigations included in our findings thus far have ele uh, elevated and prioritized walking as a mode. Now, in terms of bicycle co connectivity, the site is uniquely uh, positioned to take advantage of its adjacency to the Mount Vernon Trail and the existing local bike routes. While these are great amenities, there are gaps in the existing bicycle network and challenges uh, to east-west mobility like the George Washington Memorial Parkway and uh, rail tracks further, further to the west mean that there's a lot of potential to unlock here. Uh, based on feedback we've received from the community, our recommendations include design strategies that provide suitable routes for different users. There's a more leisurely route, Mandarin route along the water that's shown in purple. A commuter route for folks who are just trying to get through north-south as quick as they possibly can, really, uh, and that's shown in yellow. And a local route for those who are looking to access the site um, that's shown here in green. 
This will be further uh, encouraged through improved wayfinding uh, that we, we plan to work with uh, in coordination with the National Park Service. In terms of uh, bicycle friendly strategies and recommendations, the project will leverage its proximity to the Mount Vernon Trail by coordinating with the Park Service to make improvements to the trail, including potentially uh, providing multiple high quality connection points and by making contributions to improve the multi-use uh, trail along the Northol Norfolk Southern property, including a potential rails to trails conversion. These improvements will complement city plan improvements, including a connection to the Potomac Avenue Trail from East Abington Drive westwards and trail improvements along East Abington Drive between Slater's Lane and the multi-use trail to the south. Regarding local connectivity, uh, the project will extend and connect the local bicycle network by providing on-site, on-street bicycle facilities, which connect the project directly to the local bicycle network. Um, this is via providing bicycle lanes on Royal Street extension to connect the project directly to the local bicycle network to the south on Royal Street by providing a low speed uh, bicycle friendly curbless street for all users uh, via the Woonerf, providing bicycle lanes um, north of the Woonerf to where Fairfax Street bends into Slater's Lane, and then providing bicycle lanes on Slater's Lane as an extension of the existing facilities that are on Slater's Lane west of the parkway, completing that local connection. In addition, the project has proposed to provide a capital bike share station, on-site short-term and long-term bicycle parking, and a transportation management plan framework that promotes cycling as a mode with a host of transportation demand measures. Uh, PRGS will include a new internal roadway network on the project site in line with the Old Town's uh, North Small Area Plan. Uh, this network will con uh, connect to the existing roadway network at Slater's Lane, North Royal Street, and North Fairfax Street. The operations and the geometrical layout of these streets as currently designed is based on the Old Town North Small Area Plan, the city's complete street guidelines and the traffic operations analysis conducted as part of the multimodal transportation study and through extensive coordination with city staff. The number of vehicular travel uh, lanes on the internal streets was designed to accommodate traffic with the minimal cross sections to make the streets only as big as they need to be, including the provision of on-street parallel parking spaces and curb extensions where feasible. There will be a centralized below grade garage to provide the vast majority of parking for the entire site. There will be four garage access points at blocks B, C, E, and F. The below gray garage will be connected so that you're able to enter and exit at different location points. For example, if you enter at garage, enter the garage from block C, you can exit via block E and vice versa. While this will be refined as part of the subsequent DSUPs, the site has been designed to accommodate loading activity at each block, internal to the block and not on main streets, as well as pickup uh, and drop off activity. A number of vehicle specific strategies have been incorporated into designs thus far. Um, those include uh, provision of alleys to create back of house areas that help minimize conflicts between modes, locating access controls for the below grade garage to minimize conflicts and queuing, timing and phasing, signal timing phasing is, um, and strategies uh, to balance prioritization of modes at the intersections, prioritization of local versus commuter traffic, traffic calming measures to discourage cut through, and the promotion of safety and vision zero strategies. A potential new east-west uh, connection to the parkway and Abington Drive to allow for additional site circulation and to adjust impacts uh, on the existing intersections of Slater Drive and Bashford Lane, sorry, Slater's Lane and Bashford uh, Lane has been uh, proposed. This connection would include an extension of the trail and, other cross and another crossing point for bicycles and pedestrians as well in line with the city's mobility plan. I need to emphasize that based on the results of the multimodal transportation study, this potential east-west connection is not a must-have, uh, but would be a nice to have additional access uh, to the parkway. Uh, uh, lastly, on this slide, speaking to transit, in coordination with city staff, the project proposes realigning uh, the dash route uh, number 34 through the internal roadway network of the project site, running along Royal Street, the primary street and Slater's Lane. Additionally, there will be um, two two-way transit stops for the 34 line uh, proposed um, to be located on the primary road. And Hillco will continue to coordinate with the city and DASH to improve the frequency of the planned transit service to the site. Switching to the Wooner, um, one of the unique uh, streetscape, element, streetscape, el streetscape element and treatment that has gotten, as we've talked about earlier in this presentation, quite a lot of uh, positive reaction from stakeholders is the Wooner. For those that are not familiar with the concept, it's a Dutch term for a living street. 
which has come to embody techniques which include shared space, traffic calming, and low speeds. It's a space where bicyclists, pedestrians, and vehicles will mix within the space, but really its design will reflect an intent to prioritize bicycle and pedestrian activity and provide slow vehicle access only if necessary. Some of those specific design elements include different types of paving to, to delineate the space, visual cues such as trees and furnishings that uh, separate and protect the different modes and movements and mechanisms which act like vehicle deterrents such as planters to close off the space for special events. The roadway and vehicular access schemes have been designed around this uh, in such a way that to envision closures of the Wooner due to special events or just due to high pedestrian and bicycle volumes still maintain access to garage and loading to all and the overall uh, vehicular circulation for the site. Now moving north, I uh, want to spend some time walking you all through the recent um, evolutions and the changes that have been made to um, Slater's Lane around Block F. Uh, under existing conditions, Slater's Lane east of the parkway is the only roadway connecting the residential and commercial users north of uh, and west of PRGS to the rest of the street grid. It dead ends to the east with no pedestrian or bicycle connectivity to the Mount Vernon Trail. Along this section of Slater's Lane, the original CDD uh, that was submitted tied Slaters into the overall street network and included Sharrows, which are also known as uh, shared lane bicycle markings, a conceptual but yet somewhat uh, wonky intersection design, as well as a conceptual uh, connection to the Mount Vernon Trail. Thanks to some information that were provided to us by the neighbors at Marina Towers, uh, which also uh, coincided with conversations we were having to this, with the city. This led us to the revised design that's shown here on the slide. This revised design pulls the roadway to the south to maximize open space in the north and set back from Marina Towers. Uh, it extends the bicycle lanes through the parkway intersection and connects them to the local route to the south and the Mount Vernon Trail just east of this intersection. We've also designed the intersection to be as compact as possible with a driveway treatment as you enter Marina Towers to indicate to cars to stay on the main roadway unless they specifically want to access Marina Towers. Finally, th this design uh, continues to tie Slater's Lane into the overall street network as envisioned by the Old Town uh, North Small Area Plan, uh, providing users on Slater's Lane alternative routes by car, bicycle, and by foot to get to and from their homes and businesses to the south through the site. Now, to pull all of this back together, uh, this slide summarizes the tremendous number of transportation-related improvements that are proposed as part of this project. We've covered most, if not all of these, so I'm not gonna read through each one of them, but a high level they include the completion of the street network and provision of new sidewalks and pathways for people of all ages and abilities, curb extensions and crosswalks throughout the site, new signalized intersections, on-street bike facilities to the site, new bike and pedestrian connections to the Mount Vernon Trail, multiple bus stops and the realignment of a bus uh, route through the site and significant um, green and programmable open space. In terms of the highlights of the off-site transportation related improvements, the project will improve many areas that, as we have heard loud and clear from the community, are lacking in multimodal amenities and are unpleasant or difficult to navigate or are challenges to connectivity and mobility. And those include improvements to Slater's Lane at the uh, GW Memorial Parkway and east of it, improvements to the intersection um, uh, Bashford Lane in the parkway, improvements to the Mount Vernon Trail, Con, um, contributions to improve the multi-use trail along the Norfolk Southern property, including a, a potential rails to trails conversion and a potential new east-west, multimodal east-west connection to the parkway and Eppington Drive to allow for better site circulation and to reduce pressure on the east uh, existing intersections of Slaters and Bashford. And so with that, I, I'll conclude my portion of the presentation. I believe I'm passing it uh, over to Melissa. Thanks so much, Dan. Um, so if we could go to the next slide, we know that this is a topic that people care a lot about. Um, we are not starting deconstruction anytime soon. It likely will not start until 2023, but we wanted to make sure that people know that before we start, uh, we will hold informational meetings that will review the specifics of that uh, process. And that will include a construction management plan, you know, our schedule, the routes that trucks will take going to and from the site, 
things like uh, how we will control rodents during, uh, during the deconstruction period, what our noise and vibration uh, control plans will be, uh, how we'll monitor dusts, where the workers will park, uh, doing uh, talking about all of those all of those topics and they will continue to be available on our website as well. So just wanted folks to know um, that as we move into that uh, process that we will have informational community meetings on it. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Juliana Connolly, who's our executive vice president of environmental remediation. Thanks, Melissa. Good evening, everyone. Um, as Melissa mentioned, I lead, I lead environmental remediation work for HRP. In Virginia, the way that, that our environmental cleanup of the site, so and what I mean by that is soil and groundwater cleanup, the, the program that that will be conducted under is the Virginia Voluntary Remediation Program. We did enter the site into the Virginia Voluntary Remediation Program last year early in 2021, and then during the fall of 2021, conducted our additional, our initial site characterization sampling. And what that means is sampling in areas where based on past use of the site or based on visual observations of conditions at the site, we have reason to believe there might be subsurface contamination. So that work was conducted in the fall of last year, that work is documented in a report called a preliminary site characterization report, which is available on our project website and was submitted to Virginia DEQ, Department of Environmental Quality. And that work shows there are some locations where we have concentrations above screening levels, Virginia screening levels. What will happen next is that as demolition proceeds, We'll conduct additional sampling in areas that are physically inaccessible because buildings or other structures are located on top of them. We'll do that additional sampling, compare those results to screening levels. Once we have that full data set, we'll conduct what's called a human health risk assessment for the areas where concentrations exceed screening levels. And that will allow us to identify areas where remediation is warranted. We'll then conduct those remediation activities in coordination with the deconstruction and development activities. So, so that's sort of how the, the remediation progress uh, process will proceed at the site. And I'll hand it over next to, just making sure I have the, <laughs> to Mike Babcock with Sustainable Building Partners. Thanks, Mike. Thank you, Juliana. Um, as we sort of move to the next phase of sustainability, um, Juliana talked about how we can create a new canvas from which to build on. Um, Melissa outlined sort of, you know, the de deconstruction process, and we've talked about some of the visioning. Uh, sustainability has been a key point in this process uh, from the very early onset. Um, Hilco is very committed to sustainability. I think they have a history and have shown that in previous community meetings. Um, but we want to start uh, this section with really reiterating the sustainability framework that's outlined as part of the city of Alexandria's goals. Uh, basically what we're working from in a regulatory condition, policy, planning, outlook and performance. Uh, sustainability touches everything we do. Um, so these documents really work to try and identify how we can begin to measure success uh, from a sustainable performance perspective. The first document, the Old Town North Small Area Plan, uh, some of the key components of sustainability that are outlined in that document are lead for neighborhood development, um, which we're going to touch on in a second. Uh, sustainability master plan, also a coordinated sustainability strategy, which really looks to identify short, mid, and long-term strategies that work to achieve meaningful outcomes and results. Um, and then strive, explore, and encourage. Striving to achieve carbon neutrality uh, for the site by 2040. Um, carbon neutral buildings by 2030. What does that mean? We're going to define that. Um, also looking to leverage and explore district-wide systems. Uh, Hilco being a, a developer that looks at long-term um, advantages and, and what we can do at a district-wide scale. Uh, what has merit, applicability, and viability, and encouragement. Um, and then the green building policy uh, as well is the next one where we focus on additional energy savings, additional performance points, 
indoor environmental quality, enhanced level uh, of commissioning and thermal comfort. And then lastly, the environmental action plan of 2040, which was also developed around the same time frame, really looks at that outlook. You know, how do we get to achieve these goals that the city has outlined um, and everything in there from an equitable perspective, um, looking at stormwater management, carbon, overall development quality um, in a meaningful fashion. Next slide. So the first one, um, Lee, that some of you may be familiar with um, is a way to sort of quantify sustainability in buildings that cover different um, aspects of, uh, of a development. Um, we recognize that frameworks are important because it does hold us accountable. Uh, the USGBC's leadership in environmental design, um, and uh, that is a tool we are going to use as part of this process when we move forward uh, with advancing the design of the site and the buildings. It's a rigorous third-party system, um, and as I mentioned earlier, as part of the Old Town North Small Area Plan, the project will be pursuing lead in D. Um, similar to the description of the infrastructure and DSUP process, lead in D actually looks at things that the building doesn't, which is smart location and linkages, some of the stuff that um, OGB and Grove Slade has talked about, uh, focusing on conservation, housing, jobs proximity, dwelling units per acre, habitat, landscape design, civic spaces, and other meaningful connection points. It also looks at neighborhood pattern and design for real community engagement. How do we get our residents um, of the city of Alexandria engaging with this in a walkable, safe, connected environment, um, green infrastructure and buildings, uh, building level performance. And uh, this is also, I think, further reinforced in the vision that was uh, described earlier. And also mentioned that after you get through the neighborhood, we will be committing to hitting the green building policy requirements at the building level as well. It's still early in that process, but we are recognizing that as a goal. So, so sustainability is an approach. Um, as I mentioned, sustainability covers lots of things. These are some of the impact categories that we're really putting a uh, heightened focus around. Uh, we want sustainability to permeate throughout the development. It can be expressed in many ways. Some of the things you might see, um, like open space, green roof, solar, and other things you might not see, like energy efficiency, embodied carbon and materials. Um, we are in the process of developing a coordinated sustainability strategy that is running parallel to the infrastructure DSUP. Um, we're also uh, looking to identify some aspirational, but also realistic options uh, for what we can do. Uh, part of our, our, our task and our goal and challenge is to see what we can do today, but also uh, a little bit of a leap of faith of, of what will be available to us in the near future as the project builds out over time. But these are some of the things and categories which we're going to look at strategies to address all these items, uh, some of which on the district-wide scale include heating and cooling on a district-wide level, stormwater management, leveraging what you have uh, on a site-wide to really promote sustainability. Next slide. Carbon neutrality, uh, a lot of attention put on this and, and from the city and, and other local jurisdictions um, all over um, the country. Uh, one of the things that we have looked at is, is mentioned earlier, uh, partaking in a voluntary uh, carbon neutrality analysis to really identify what it is. Um, we, we understand sort of the impact of carbon in the built environment, um, and we thought it was really important to define that um, for this development as it's built out. And really what we're talking about is trying to neutralize the life cycle carbon emissions associated with the design construction, operation, and maintenance of the project. And what we're doing from a design decision standpoint through material choices, systems, infrastructure, uh, maintenance, all to improve the carbon position of the environment. And then how can we neutralize that impact um, as part of the goals to strive for carbon neutrality? Um, as mentioned, we, we use the carbon neutrality analysis to create a dialogue, a very generative discussion around what it takes uh, to make a carbon neutral site at this scale. Next slide. In very simple terms, uh, you know, when we look at carbon neutrality, you know, the first of which operational carbon 
energy efficiency, the stuff you might not see. Energy efficiency all day, every day, no real surprise here. Um, that also gets into resiliency um, as we uh, continue to uh, need more power from the grid, how that relationship works um, at the local site level. Um, coincident peak demand, um, how buildings communicate with the grid and how that relationship takes place. And then district-wide strategies. Are there opportunities to share uh, resources between buildings? Uh, we're looking at different uh, density blends between commercial and residential. And, and are there opportunities to leverage that um, while also planning for future phasing? Um, the next, which is actually the first is embodied carbon. We have woven that into this discussion. We didn't limit it to just energy performance. Embodied carbon is that carbon you do on day one, um, which comes before operational and it's the materiality. Uh, there's been a lot of height, heightened focus around carbon neutrality recently. Um, with enhanced enclosure solutions, new structural uh, opportunities, performance-based specifications. There's a lot of new energy and vigor in, in how we can uh, reduce the carbon of the built environment uh, prior to introducing energy, cooling, lighting, and all the things that, that make a building uh, a reality. So that's something that we have woven into this carbon neutrality analysis. Electrification, a term you've probably heard in the past. Um, it's very hot topic right now. Um, the idea there is that as we electrify our buildings and the grid gets cleaner, uh, we're going to have the opportunity to have deeper um, reductions in emissions over time, um, and we can be more responsive to the grid. Renewable energy, uh, is once we've got the energy down and we look to offset and we've got our embodied carbon electrification, on-site and off-site renewable energy, um, it is very important. We, we're setting targets and, and goals for that as well, while also looking to manage competing priorities. Um, when you talk about roof area, open space, and all the other sustainable criteria, Offsite, what you don't see is really important because that's how new development can uh, meet future demand through renewable energy um, and what that looks like uh, in terms of getting the grid cleaner through renewable sources, solar, wind at a scale um, that would power this, this facility. You know, for example, the, the grid serving Virginia, uh, the SRVC is the sixth cleanest grid in the United States. United States. And over the last two years, it's improved by about 16%, which is great. Uh, we still have a long way to go. Uh, but when the buildings get more efficient and the grid gets cleaned, it's a real uh, symbiotic uh, relationship there. Next slide. So what does that look like in terms of actual goals and targets? Uh, through this process, there's a lot of technical content that resulted in these simple metrics. Um, but what we're looking at is an energy efficiency target uh, for the project that's effectively twice as good as the current green building policy. You take the average of 14 and 11, that's 12 and a half. So you're effectively doubling. So that's a pretty aggressive goal and target. And we thought this was an opportunity to really strive for carbon neutrality and, and look for opportunities to reduce the operational energy of the building. Embodied carbon reduction, 10%. Uh, beyond standard baseline construction, um, electrification, minimizing um, scope one emissions and on-site combustion to the extent possible, um, on-site renewable energy target of 3%, which is not an insignificant amount when you talk about the amount of area. There's been a lot of uh, improvement in renewable energy efficiency over the last three years. Uh, it's been a fairly stagnant performance, the previous 50, um, but there's more and more heightened focus on renewable. And as these buildings come online and we introduce uh, on-site solar, we think we're going to be able uh, to really have a, an effective solution there. And then off-site renewables, power purchase agreements, utility structure, uh, ways to neutralize the remaining amount of energy. There's not enough surface area to produce it on site. But if we can clean up the grid while building a sustainable environment, you're hitting it from both ends. And then some of those ancillary benefits that have been mentioned before, cycling, minimizing single occupancy vehicles, transportation, electric charging infrastructure, uh, you name it. So these are some of the components that we're exploring further. Uh, the first step was establishing targets and goals that can help be a guideline for the development in the foreseeable future. 
So with that, I'd like to uh, turn it back over to uh, pass the baton to Mary Catherine. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate that. Um, so what are the next steps? Um, we wanted to end tonight by reminding you that you can continue to engage in this process. We'll be having additional public tours of the site on Friday, June 10th and Saturday, June 11th. Registration information for those tours is coming soon to our website at www.hrpalx.com. And the public hearings on the CDD concept plan are June 23rd in the Planning Commission and July 5th for the City Council. We want to continue to work together as we transform this unsightly power plant site into a vibrant mixed use community that weaves into the fabric of Old Town North. And now we look forward to answering your questions as best we can. Um, as I indicated earlier, we're going to um, be able to have questions both in written form and verbally. And so um, we have a couple of questions already in the Q&A section, but you can also raise your hand and we can unmute you if you'd like to ask your question. So I'm gonna start with one of the um, first ones in the Q&A uh, and it is, to what extent will infrastructure bill funds be pursued to increase, increase resilience and reduce carbon? Melissa, do you wanna take that one? Yeah, I would say um, that's undetermined at the at the moment, um, but we are investigating what the opportunities might be um, either at the federal or state level through DOE or through Dominion, um, what kind of grants or pilot programs uh, there could be that the, that the project uh, could look into. So it's a little early uh, since we don't have a, a full picture of what, what we're building yet, but that is definitely something we're considering. Thanks. We don't have any hands up yet, so I'm going to continue on with our written questions. And it is um, um, the term uh, carbon neutrality. Are you including CO2 equivalent emissions? In other words, methane emissions associated with gas use, global, high global warming potential gases associated with air conditioning? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, when we when we talk about CO two and carbon, you know, everything we do or touch, you know, effectively has an impact there. Um, in the built environment, there's many different layers. There's CO two associated with the energy generation in the power plant. Uh, there's CO two associated or global warming potential with refrigerant choices. Uh, there's actually uh, phase out strategies for some of our current refrigerants, which are decent. Um, so by the time this development is built, there's going to be likely new refrigerants coming online that are going to be an even sharper reduction in emissions. So when we talk about um, one of the nice things about LEED is it gives us a framework to hitting certain enhanced refrigerant requirements. So the CO2 emissions associated with the refrigerant itself, not just the energy use. Um, in terms of gas and methane, yes, you know, methane um, is, a, is a driver, that's the, the leakage, uh, also associated with the combustion emissions. Um, so when we go more electric um, and minimize the natural gas on site, um, we are inherently reducing the emissions associated with the natural gas. That's one of those primary drivers in the carbon neutrality analysis is to move to more electric. Now to that point, uh, there's today and there's tomorrow. Today, the predominant source of fuel generation on the grid is natural gas. It has surplanted coal, which is great. It's a lot cleaner. But that next step is renewable energy generation. And that's where power purchase agreements, wind, solar, that's that next evolution. So as that grid get, continues to get cleaner and our development goes more and more electric, heat pump based technologies, things like that, we will continue to see sharper reductions in CO2 emissions. Thanks, Mike. Um, so we don't have any more questions in the Q&A box and we don't have any hands raised. So we have had a very comprehensive uh, presentation tonight. So perhaps maybe we were up, had the opportunity to answer any, some open questions that, that folks might've had. But if anybody has any questions, feel free to raise your hand if you'd like to ask them. Okay. Melissa, I think that means we've done a good job tonight. Or we bored everyone. Exactly, that's probably true. <laughs> Hopefully it's not that. <laughs> Hopefully it's not. But, um, oh, there's one hand raised. Here we go, here we go. Alyssa Bowler. You're gonna to have to unmute yourself. 
Right. So I'm a Marina Tower owner. I've lived in Germany for almost 20 years. I would like to know if there's any tax impact on this for me, if I have to pay more Alexandria taxes. Melissa, you want to take that? You want me to take that I, one? I don't, yeah, I don't think we could, we don't set the tax rates in Alexandria, so I'm not sure we could comment on that. I'm not sure. Yeah, that. there are many factors that go into okay. determining what your um, effective tax payments what? are going to be, and so we don't okay. have any. Okay, but your that. Hillco company i don't i i guess you're you're a development company so you're going to stand to profit um mm, yeah i don't know i it looks like there's a lot of money being pumped into i'm happy about it totally happy about it but i'm just wondering because i'm wondering should i sell my property now or should i sell it in 10 years when you guys are done I think that's a decision that you are really going to have to make based on um, all of the circumstances that would would influence whether you want to maintain your property or don't maintain your property. I think the redevelopment of the former coal fired power plant site is uh, um, uh, nothing if not a benefit to all of the residents that live around it that won't have to look at it any further and now we'll have a, this vibrant and mixed use uh, project nearby, but appreciate uh, the question. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. We do have one more comment, uh, one more question in the uh, Q&A, and it is, are the offsite GHG emission reductions components of the carbon neutrality analysis, like offsets, RECs, power purchase agreements, steps that Hilco would be paying for or the city and future residents would be paying for? So the way power purchase agreements uh, would work or RECs, renewable energy certificates, for example, drive the market. That's, you know, wind turbines, solar, you know, and farms and that sort of thing, which can actually be quite profitable for landowners. Um, so they're using in, in, for renewable energy generation. Uh, the way that would work, um, because there's an owner and a tenant component, say, for example, the multifamily building, uh, the owner will have control over the utility consumption of the house use, right? So there is a significant portion of that energy. So that relationship to the grid or that customer, um, Hillco, um, by association, if they were to aggregate all these buildings, would be going to the utility to research a uh, power purchase agreement, which could come in the form of a fixed contract agreement over a set period of time. It's like any other commodity. We want to buy this much power for this long. We want it to be renewable. Give us your best deal. Uh, Rex look to uh, take power that was um, delivered in one location to another. It also very important. So as that market increases in price, it incentivizes those to uh, produce more renewable energy because there's higher demand for it. Um, what the tenants do um, is, is something that we have mentioned in previous uh, community meetings regarding um, a certain percentage of the building, especially in the multifamily uh, uh, buildings, is going to be tenant controlled. That's going to be a direct relationship with the utility. So um, I know Dom Dominion's looking at, you know, ways of greening up power purchases at a local smaller level. Um, but when we talk about uh, carbon neutrality from the perspective or lens of the development, we are really looking at what the potential is. I think it's also important that it's very speculative right now, right? And until we go to market and really see what that true cost is to do that, um, we have done some research, but uh, at this point, we're, what we're talking about, there's the, the hill cone owner response in, in power purchase and then the potential tenant um, on the residential side. Thanks, Mike. Okay, we are very close to the time frame that uh, we had identified for the, the um, uh, presentation. And so we have no further written questions and we have no hands up. And so we just really would like to say thank you again uh, to everybody who's participated um, in these discussions with us. It has been a really um, informative uh, year and uh, almost a year and a half. Um, again, this, we're not finished. We're going to our public hearings in June and July, um, but we're really excited to be at this stage in the process where we're, um, uh, as we said, starting on the first tier and moving on to the, the next two. So um, thank you so much for joining us today. Please join us for some tours if you're available on June 10th and 11th. And um, thank you again. Take care. Thanks everyone.